How's it going? I'm James. I'm here representing Abridged. Um, this talk is uh, sort of, it's called Beyond Burner, Intuitive Design and Incremental Decentralization. So uh, really focused on UX issues. Um, Abridged is a uh, development toolkit. Uh, we're focused on intuitive design for blockchain applications to onboard new users. Um, my background, if, you, if you've seen me before, I, I was with the grants team. You may know me from there at the EF. Um, but this is sort of the new project that uh, I've been working on since April. Um, so a little overview, we'll go over what Beyond Burner really means, uh, the significance of the application layer, uh, the current state of where we are within adoption, and then what fixing these issues actually looks like. So why Beyond Burner? Um, so the Beyond, the Beyond Burner is the Beyond Burger narrative plus the Burner wallet. Uh, both of these uh, sort of industries, which is uh, the cryptocurrency space as well as the uh, alternative meats industry are sort of holistic solutions that are trying to disrupt incumbent uh, like systems. And they sort of face similar adoption hurdles, which is mainly like unfamiliar uh, like, uh, experiences and an unfamiliar product, um, which is also somewhat inconvenient for people who want to uh, get at, like use it um, and they don't know how uh, so, so it creates the unfamiliarity and inconvenience creates discomfort and uh, friction for their end users um, at a high level it's kind of like I like meat I you know I don't know what this vegan stuff is um, and and I don't know I don't, I don't really like the taste of it or something um, for ethereum it's like I don't know what a private key is what is gas and why does it take so long to use um, these applications. Um, on top of that, we're also building somewhat in a desert. We, we don't really have a lot of user data uh, to pull from to make uh, many design decisions. So, um, the, and, and then another thing is, this is just another sort of example, where we are, Ethereum has about 0.01% of the user base of Facebook. That's the daily active users, or monthly active users on MetaMask, divided by the monthly active of Facebook, and then uh, meat alternatives are, are sort of significantly ahead of that. With the Beyond Burger narrative, they've kind of they've gained a per, per half of a percentage of the market uh, of the meat industry, which is pretty great. So we need to 50x our user base in order to to match what they've done there. Um, <clears throat> so again, the Beyond Burger narrative, they kind of broke through that stigma of of meat, of, of, of imitating that meat flavor. So you can be a meat eater, go to Burger King and buy a Beyond Burger and be as satisfied. And it, and it uh, sort of points to the fact that users will choose holistic solutions if it's convenient and comfortable for them. Um, and that's sort of what we need to get to for Ethereum applications to actually be adopted by, by end users. We can't sort of shove uh, this sort of decentralization down people's throats, right? It's not, uh, not, not as useful. Um, and so the first, I think, the first real iteration of this was the Burner Wallet with Austin Griffith. He kind of made onboarding a thing at ETH Denver in 2019 that was the largest point of sale system that has been spun up in the Ethereum ecosystem uh, since inception. Um, it created instant value for people that were on the ground that are wanting to use that network. Um, and so how do you onboard? Um, well, you have to inspire trust within your user base, and it also has to be efficient um, and convenient, right? Um, the old paradigm of key management is challenging. I, I, uh, I see the future as, as key management, private key management as, as being sort of subsect to um, a new contract-based management system. My mom won't likely ever download a private key, most likely, right? Um, the, a new paradigm that we're suggesting in Beyond Burner is to use these uh, burner wallet keys or ephemeral keys uh, with a contract account. And so it's essentially a multi-sig that you can control funds with a number of different keys, and all of those are uh, potentially temporary, right? So there's essentially, they're, they're sort of burner keys that are tied to a, to a contract. Um, this is a design that's really been pioneered somewhat by James Young, um, and this is sort of a quote from him, programmable money deserves programmable access, uh, which I, I fully agree in, and I think it's a, a pretty sort of exciting new uh, frontier to be developed. Um, and so why Beyond Burger? The Burner Wallet is an instance of the Beyond Burger narrative and the success of the Beyond Burger uh, within the Ethereum ecosystem. 
So uh, why do we care about mass adoption? I think we need to talk a little bit about the significance of the application layer. Um, the application layer is where value is delivered to end users. Um, and so that's really fundamentally important. If we don't have that value delivered, all of the work that we're doing in the back end with scaling, it's sharding, et cetera, will go to waste. Or it's just kind of we're developing in a silo. Um, so what does it look like today? Well, it's mainly DeFi, right? The killer app of Ethereum is like Maker and ICOs. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's pre maybe prediction markets, but that hasn't really even really caught on yet. Um, so mainly it's like you're trying to make and save money. Uh, the, the future of Ethereum it was, is, is a different, like we, we have a lot of idealistic, uh, idealistic philosophies around the future. And you know, Dean had a nice little uh, Twitter uh, rampage about, about this, obviously, so what? Uh, trolling the idea of this, but a lot of ICOs did come out in 2017 very serious about inventing new business models around blockchain, around an immutable ledger system to actually like solve uh, real uh, world problems. We also have the like bank the unbanked. Um, essentially, we have the potential to create better systems if we gain this adoption, right? And so what does user adoption look like? Mainly makes money, creates better systems. Um, and that could also mean like providing knowledge or comfort or like social belonging, um, dopamine to, to the end user. Like all of that stuff is, is essentially value for them. And fun is also sort of included in that value proposition potentially. Um, and for developers, um, if you get users, that means you can actually make money, which is a huge thing. Uh, because today, the money is really reserved for exchanges, right? Who, no one is making real revenue aside from exchanges and consultants, more or less, right? Um, and so that's sort of the exciting proposition is that you could make a sustainable ecosystem if you actually develop systems where developers are able to build applications to attract real end users. Um, and so to the current state of development, um, where are we? So like I sort of mentioned earlier, we're really focused on scalability. This has been the holy grail, and this is probably 90% of the talks that you've heard at DevCon thus far. Um, but again, we're sort of building in a desert uh, where we're sort of siloed. We don't have a lot of uh, interaction within these systems that we're, that we're um, coming up with. Um, and even the core of our ecosystem, you know, we still haven't adopted Ethereum to like pay for things uh, within our existing infrastructures, right? And within the, the companies who are really pioneering this, um, it would be great to sort of um, have a bit more dogfooding, right, um, for these things to happen. Uh, and so I, I also propose that we're sort of focused on, at least from a narrative perspective, potentially uh, the back end more than we need to be, because the front end should be driving the back end uh, solutions. Um, this is another quote from James, working with him. It's really great. He just has like a lot of wisdom to share. <laughs> um, but don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, probably not original, but you know, attributing it to him. Um, so the current state, $25 billion was raised in 2017, or since 2017. Um, there's about 10 dApps with 20, or 2,000 users each on, on the daily. Um, again, 0.01% of the Facebook user base. Very few have product market fit, if any. Um, so we're well within the chasm, right? Um, and the reason for this too is um, the developer challenges. Uh, this is a survey built by Fluence in 2019. If you haven't seen it, I think it's probably the best UX survey out there today. Um, and they kind of just go over all of the issues with developing blockchain apps. Um, it's, it's really difficult. <laughs> it's, you know, we're, we're both developing this new interface and then you have the tools that you're also developing at the same time. And, um, there's just a lot of issues. So again, you're, you're coming back to, uh, you know, we, we're sort of forcing private keys down end users' throats, more or less. Um, this is also a, a, a stat that I saw uh, on another presentation that I thought was really interesting. I believe it comes from a CryptoKitties uh, study. <clears throat> so uh, how do you fix end user issues? And I'm gonna go back to onboarding and scaling. <laughs> and mo focus on that onboarding side. Uh, because this is beyond burner again, so it's again focused on that account contract with ephemeral keys to create a programmable access of funds. Um, and if you don't have effective onboarding, there's no reason to have a state channel or second layer solution. Um, there's no there's no real need for ETH 2.0 if we if we don't have enough end users to drive traffic. 
Um, the approach to really understand this is you gotta know your user base, create intuitive interfaces, and then iterate with the feedback that you're given. Um, and that, a lot of that means to ship um, quickly and, and, and gather information uh, as quickly as possible. <clears throat> and so again, sort of iterate why onboarding sucks. It's uncomfortable and inconvenient, primarily. And I think everyone can kind of appreciate that. I'm sure everyone has tried to like talk to someone like, hey, yeah, that's like great, you know, come on to MetaMask or something, and whoever you're talking to is like, no, I'm not really sure, like Compound's kind of weird, I don't really want to download this thing. Um, so a uh, hypothesis that we developed at a bridge was, okay, if we just use Web2 like flows, um, like AWS authentication, for instance, uh, we could maybe onboard more users, and that, that could uh, happen. Um, and so we sort of went on a rampage. We, we came with an SDK in June, and, on, and like integrated it with as many applications as we could. We hit like eight or nine, essentially. Um, and so, so all of these applications sort of have a bridge tooling integrated into it. And um, the most popular have been YOLO Rect and Dow House. Um, they actually have real end users. If you want to actually experience what this account contract design feels like, definitely check these uh, both out. YOLO Rect is just a binary options trading, you know, betting platform, and then Dow House is going to be a, a DAO. Uh, you spin up Moloch DAOs, right? So uh, it's, they have like 10 different DAOs moving along there, which is pretty exciting. Um, and what we found from that sort of um, all of this uh, feedback uh, was that there's two types of users that you're looking at when you're developing um, blockchain applications. One is for Web3 and the other is for Web2. Um, so, like, Web3 users are really interested in, uh, you know, privacy, um, Web3 provider, they prefer MetaMask, and um, self-sovereignty, of course. Um, it, it's, I, it, I, I uh, spoke with Nate Grinninger, who is building in Web3 as well, and he's kind of describes it as, as coddling an ember in a damp forest, where you're just trying to get it to kind of, like, keep heating up, right? And, um, of course, these are, like, MetaMask users. Uh, for Web2 users, though, they kind of, uh, they likely don't care as much. They're, they're looking for just like intuitive, fun things to use, which um, Burner and like the abridged like uh, smart contracts or account contracts is, is potentially a more viable solution. Um, and so the common denominator, everyone wants a seamless experience. They don't want to think, they, wanna, they don't want to trust what, what you're doing, and they don't want um, to waste time in the onboarding process. Otherwise, you won't you won't get there. You won't be able to show the value of what the application is. Um, so to us, that looks like, um, at least at first, when someone is getting used to understanding what decentralization and what Web3 provides or, or Ethereum offers, um, no seed phrase download. Um, native mobile apps are really nice. Uh, all the onboarding occurs within the application, so no needing to switch screens. And then account recovery options are also included uh, within your uh, management system. So again, we want to create instant value for the end user, and um, the account contracts are really uh, the way potentially to do that. It's, it's a more flexible way, and the ephemeral keys associated with the account contracts is, is in particular uh, uh, useful. Is you can recover your funds and you can also uniquely permission each key for, for different use cases, right? So each key could have different access. And this is sort of what Beyond Burner really aims at. Um, you have a account contract that has multiple keys, all for different reasons. You have your phone, your computer, um, your guardian, your mom or girlfriend or, or you know, whoever. Um, maybe you have a Portis or Taurus integration as well as a sort of master reset. Um, YOLO Rex, maybe you're interested in playing, you also play Gods Unchained, and you're part of Metacartella. All of those could have different um, levels of fund access, um, and that's all programmable. So if you end up losing your phone, thankfully you have all these other keys that you can build a, your, your next phone with, and you can recover uh, your funds uh, through, through uh, a social recovery process. Um, and again, this, this system has a lot of possibilities that have yet to be developed in terms of um, app linking and recovery flows. Um, so if you're interested in sort of building that kind of stuff, please come talk to me after this. <clears throat> um, and so this kind of comes down to incremental decentralization again. You want a soft landing pad for users to come into the ecosystem and sort of understand what's going on before you just put them in the deep end. Um, and uh, 
that comes down to sort of providing that layer of trust and sort of uh, onboarding them into something that, that looks familiar while also giving them full access to their funds, um, but but not uh, not showing them a completely new system at the beginning. Um, and this also, to some extent, I, I think that dApps, um, uh, full decentralized, full stack decentralized dApps have a very small chance of actually succeeding in the near term. It's more about like Ethereum applications where you have hybrid solutions that are using like AWS and Firebase or um, you know, other sort of like centralized solutions to get things that people want to use. Um, the second piece of the onboarding puzzle is fiat ramps, of course, and you have like wire, moon pay, um, uh, ramp network, carbon, all these different solutions. I think they're all sort of competing in the same space. It's really great that that's a competitive area uh, right now. And then lastly, if you have apps, you need off-chain transactions. Um, if you have users or on your app, you, you likely need off-chain transactions in order to make a seamless experience, right? And all these teams are doing a lot of really great work uh, to provide like fully decentralized solutions uh, for these off-chain transactions. Um, at Abridge, where we actually have a off-chain uh, system as well, but it, but it does have a degree of trust. It's using a central hub um, that you could potentially collude with. There's, I'm not going to get too deep into that, um, um, but uh, that's that's kind of like essentially the the idea. Uh, and so to fix the UX issues again, you just need onboarding and, and off-chain transactions. That's kind of the combination that, that, that you need in order to make a seamless application flow. Um, and if you want to see another example, you can like scan this app. This is actually a native mobile app. Um, I don't know, like how many people have actually used like a native mobile Ethereum app that's not a wallet? Anyone? Okay, sweet. A couple? All right. Um, so, but this is a native mobile app that has uh, a, a account contract as well as the Abridge sort of off-chain solution uh, integrated into it that you can sort of play around with, it's like social tipping for content. Um, so the takeaways here, Ethereum is really difficult to use for a lot of reasons. Um, while decentralization is really, really important, it also inhibits to some extent uh, user adoption if it's going to be taken to the nth degree from the beginning. Um, there's also really difficult tools, underdeveloped tools to use within the ecosystem to develop these uh, applications, and we have no user data to actually say what tools are, are really useful, right? Um, the, <laughs> okay, uh, the uh, need to uh, uh, create trust, right? We need to create trust for the end users um, through more intuitive design to make it convenient and comfortable, and programmable access is potentially a way um, in which to do this um, through account contracts. Um, and so I sort of am proposing that the ecosystem should spend about as much time on this issue, um, maybe not as much, obviously. I think the uh, nuances of, of connecting ETH 2.0 is gonna be a, quite a task, but Getting nailing down this flow also requires a significant amount of effort and iteration, um, and it won't happen overnight. Um, we need sort of, I'm sort of encouraging pragmatic development and hybrid architectures, um, and sort of continuing to ship solutions to gather that user feedback, uh, and, and sort of focus on end users um, rather than maybe the most idealistic situation possible. So that's, uh, this is me on the Twitter, and it's abridged uh, if you want to check out what we're doing. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that'll be all.